Okay, uh, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm uh, happy to introduce the uh, second in the uh, series of uh, MBB events this fall uh, entitled Ideas in the Fringe for those of you who were here in the first one with Steve Pinker. Um, and the general format for tonight is really to sort of capture in some sense a conversation uh, to do something slightly different than a normal lecture. Lectures, of course, are very nice because a person is giving you their thoughts and doing it in a very elegant and eloquent way. But what conversations potentially can reveal in a different way is more of the breadth of the ideas and the different ways in which they can be pushed and pulled in different directions. So that was sort of the motivation behind these. Um, so tonight, I'm, I'm delighted to um, have Michael Sandel um, from the uh, government department um, here with us. And we're going to be focusing on uh, Michael's recent book, um, Against Perfection. Um, as some of you, I mean, know, especially the undergraduates uh, here tonight, uh, Michael's piece um, was basically the same title, appeared in the Atlantic Monthly, and it has been um, one of the readings in the freshman conversations for the last two years, and has generated quite a lot of um, interest and excitement and discussion that's actually, as Tom Dingman told me, uh, continued throughout the year. And I was a part of um, one of those uh, a year or so ago, and I can uh, assert that that's true. Um, in part, the reason why um, the issues um, have, I think, generated a lot of interesting discussion is because they really sit at the interface between different kinds of areas and ways of thinking. And that's precisely what um, I and Liz Belke, as co-director of the Mind, Brain, and Behavior Program, wanted to do, is to engage discussion and debate across disciplinary boundaries. So tonight, I think what you'll see and hear about is ways in which sort of philosophical thinking and argumentation um, can be leveled at some very, very deep and profound issues in the sciences, some of them in the basic sciences, but that have very important implications for applied ethics, applied biomedical technologies, and so forth. So they really sit at the interface between psychology, biology, philosophy, and various aspects of government and economics. Um, so um, what I wanted to start um, with tonight is kind of a mental warm-up for you and for the audience. It's something that, a um, little warm-up, um, is what you often warm up with uh, in your justice class, um, which are trolley problems. But I wanted to give you some, some new ones. I mean, uh, people who have taken Michael's uh, course are familiar with the fat man case. The trolley's coming down the track, going to kill five people, but you can push the fat man in front. And given the audience response, most people say that's not OK. Um, but people are willing to say that you can turn the trolley onto a side track where it will kill one, but save five. OK. So here, here's a, a slight variant and uh, just engage you in your ideas. Um, so here comes the trolley. And up ahead is one person. And further up ahead are five people. And as the trolley continues, it will kill the one and then the five. All six. All six. OK? Now you are standing on the side of the road. And you can throw a rock and beam the one who will scream, alerting the five who then can get off the track. The one will be killed, but the five can get off. Is it OK to beam the one on the head? allowing him to scream, and allowing the five to get off. You're putting me in a tough position, Mark. <laughs> that's fine. And that's because uh, I, I like to put those questions to my students, <laughs> but I don't, I don't give them my view of it, <laughs> at least not till yet. This is only fair. Uh, and we don't, do we know anything about who the one is no. I'm about to be? No. No information about the one or the five whether he or she is a member of the Harvard faculty, for example. <laughs> no? It's not you, it's not me. <laughs> Same as before, it's the one five. You don't know anything about them. They'll scream, but then I'm not killing the person. No. I don't throw it that hard. No, no. You just cause them to go, ah! it's, not, it's not a Josh Beckett fastball. That no, I'm throwing no fastballs. No. And you're telling me, I assume you'll say yes, that I have no, no other You have no other options. options. Don't add anything. The story is what I told you. Right. Well, I would, uh, can I just toss it lightly <laughs> enough for them to say something, <laughs> to, to, to make a small yell? You, you have one option. Yeah. You can either allow the trolley to go and All right. kill six, or you yeah. can hit the one who will scream, alerting the five, to get off the track. Well, right. Not no, alerting right. them, and they will get off the track. So long as I don't kill the person, You're I think kidding. I would... I would do it, and that's because I was quickly reasoning by analogy, which is uh, actual bean balls in baseball, which are a part of backing hitters off the plate, but also 
retaliating to protect your own players if the other pitcher has hit yours. I never liked that part of baseball, <laughs> though I'm a huge <laughs> baseball fan. But I think under certain circumstances, it's justifiable, if, especially if the hitter is A-Rod, let's say, somebody like that. <laughs> so, yeah, given that analogy, yes, I could see my way clear to doing that. Okay. Now, would you agree that you are using the one as a means? As a yes. means to the greater good? Yes. Okay, good. Now I'm going to give you case two. Yes. Same. So there's five people ahead. And sitting next to you is a man in a wheelchair with a sign that says, I've led a good life. I am dying. Life support has been terminated. Do not resuscitate. Is it okay to throw him onto the tracks? No. Why not? Well, first there's the question of... of uh, He's this dying. Is, this is assisted suicide plus. Is that, you're, that's you're, what you're no, you're not, you're, not, you're not assisting because he's dying. I mean, he's, he's, he's on his way. But he's I dying. sure I, I'm helping him on his way and I'm doing what you're telling me to do. It's faster, yes. He'll so, be there faster. Well, it's assisted suicide plus because I'm performing what you would maybe describe as a kindness to the man. And at the same time, you're taking advantage of his desire to die to achieve some other goal. And I would not do that because the, well, there, one question is whether uh, even without the other goal, the assisted suicide is permissible. And whether it is, I, whether it is doesn't depend, I don't think, wholly on whether the person wants to die. Okay. I think the only case for it is not fulfilling the wishes of the person. I don't think consent is decisive here. Yeah. I think if there, there can be cases of compassion where the pain and suffering, particularly of a loved one, is so intense that there could be a moral case in the name of compassion for ending their suffering if there were no other way of intending their suffering. But I would not say that the consent of the person or the sign that he displayed would give sufficient grounds for assisting in his suicide whether or not it had a side benefit. And if it did have, a, if it achieved some other purpose, I would be more hesitant, not less, uh, to do it because I would worry that my commitment to this other project was beclouding my judgment about whether I was really acting to alleviate his suffering. Okay. All right, last trolley problem. Right. Have I fallen into a trap yet? Well, not, right. not yet. <laughs> All right. Um, is coming. Yeah. Five marathon runners who have been blood doping and one marathon runner on the sidetrack who is clean? Do you turn the track onto the onto the trolley on the side track? <laughs> no, you're you're trying to. I'm getting close to your book. You're tempting <laughs> me by my opposition to to performance enhancing drugs. Correct. Well, I don't. <laughs> I am against performing <laughs> enhancing drugs, um, and I think it's morally objectionable. But I don't think the penalty should be capital punishment. <laughs> 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 okay, good. Um, so, so I've escaped the warm-up. You've escaped the warm-up. You just warmed up. All right. <laughs> so you wrote the piece in the Atlantic Monthly several years ago. Why the book? Well, the, the book has uh, enabled me to enlarge the arguments, to develop some arguments that uh, occurred to me after people reacted to the article and also to add a chapter on the ethics of stem cell research, which had not been a part of the original article, which was an opportunity to show more clearly that, uh, not only that, but the way in which I'm all in favor of using biomedical technologies for the sake of health, but not for the sake of enhancement for non-medical forms of enhancement or consumer choice. So adding 
juxtaposing the argument against enhancement, non-medical enhancement, with the defense of, of embryonic stem cell research was a way of making that further point. So let's start, let's start there. So help, 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 um, help me understand how you want to make the distinction between health and enhancement. Let, let's give, give some clear cases. Right. Well, clear cases would be if there were a way of discovering, well, there, there is now work going on that can uh, perform gene therapy to alleviate the muscle loss that comes with the aging process or with muscular dystrophy. This seems to me a great thing and a wonderful thing to be encouraged because it's a way of, of uh, enabling people who have had muscle loss due to old age to restore their human function or, or to combat a, a disease. But there are the scientist who is working on the gene therapy for, uh, for muscle, uh, muscle strength, is already getting calls from coaches and athletes who are asking, hey, will that work for me? I want to enhance my muscle growth so that I can compete better in the Olympics. That would be a clear case of the distinction between a medical use, curing a disease or, or remedying an, an ailment, restoring normal human functioning, and a non-medical use. Okay, well it seems like you actually you gave potentially three cases. One is the, the sports you know, guy who wants to run faster. Yeah. And the second is something muscular dystrophy. But the third one seems to be just aging. Right. Now, aging, I mean, I hope we don't call it an ailment because we're, we're both, we're kind of aging, um, <laughs> right? Um, and yet you kind of pooled the aging and the muscular dystrophy. Right. But d don't you want to make a distinction? Up to a point, but I would still consider treatments of disabilities by which I understand the loss of normal human functioning that comes as a result of the aging process, I would still consider that a question of health. Uh, combating Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, uh, which tend to, af to afflict people as they age, um, I think that that is still promoting, serving the goal of health. It's a medical treatment, um, and so that's why I uh, assimilated under the heading of health or medi the medical purpose. It has to do with restoring normal human functioning, whether the loss of that function is due to an injury or to a birth defect or to aging. So, 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 so let's stick with aging for a moment. I mean, yeah. so there's work by someone like Robert Sapolsky suggesting that increases in stress, which are related to increases in cortisol level, have quite a selective effect of uh, cell death in the hippocampus linked to memory. So imagine that, you know, Harvard faculty are pretty stressed out, they're losing their memory faster, and we can sort of slow that down. Would that count as an illness as opposed to just a symptom of the fact that we work too hard? Right, so wh where, do, where does that fall now? It's part of the aging process. It's part of that we're going to lose cells in those areas. But we could slow it down, let's say. We find a way to basically buffer the effects of cortisol on hippocampal cells such that the aging process is radically slowed down, at least in terms of memory. Well, I would still see that as a matter of, in this case, preserving the, the normal human function, the memory function. It is true, and I agree, I wouldn't dispute for a minute, that there are, as with any distinctions, gray areas or hard calls, because then the next question to ask is, well, why just preserve the level of memory uh, of some particular age? When, when are we at our best as far as remembering? I don't know. I'm asking. Or John would know. 20s. 20s, yeah. So then you'll say, well, Suppose even, suppose a 20-year-old wants to boost it beyond the, the normal human level. What about that could, could be the follow-up? Or it's the same kind of question that arose with, um, 
Tiger Woods mm -hmm. when he had, uh, he had LASIK surgery because he had very poor eyesight and it was hampering his golf game. But the LASIK surgery didn't give him 20-20 vision. It gave him some greatly improved over the norm of 20-20. What would be a, a super good eyesight? I don't know. Would it be 40-20, something like that, or 50-20? What? 2015. 2015, the other way. All right. So this is why I'm asking to make sure that I get it right. So, and so he has unusually good eyesight because of that. Now, you could say, all right, well, there's a close call. Mm -hmm. Because correcting a, a defect in his vision, that's remedial. That's for the sake of health. That's a medical intervention. If golfers routinely went in, even ones with 20-20 vision, if they w went in for LASIK surgery to, to improve to 2015, well, that would be an enhancement. So, but I agree that that's a close call, but it's a way. What matters is the purpose, the reason, and we can quarrel about how to draw the line in any given case. Okay, so we've got two things going. One is some notion of what is normal for human nature. Right, what's normal for our biology right. interacting with the environment to build. Right. Um, the second is what we see as perhaps superfluous in terms of living a, a life in some sense, right? Added, added, added value, right? So you've got people doing sports. Let's yeah. go back to sports for yeah. a moment. Um, people are doing sports before there was any kind of biotechnology to manipulate. People are just going in with what they have to offer. What right. you would call their gift or giftedness, right? right. Um, so, okay, now all of a sudden we're in a new world. Um, we can fix things. We can. And we can enhance things. What's the argument against the enhancement? Why, I mean, let's, let's imagine a world in which we say, you know, golf is pretty good the way it is, but golf is just merely a convention. There's no moral issue about golf. Why don't we want a world in which we say, if we can just really jack up our biology, what could a golfer do? If they can, they can now do 300 yards, let's see them hit 1,000 yards. Let's right. change the golf courses so that they're now 1,000 yards away. Right. Okay, fine. Well, there are, and you could do that by maybe developing a, a super alloy type club, too, without changing the person. And there, there are two issues here. One is the general ethic that I appeal to in the book as a moral resource to explain why we're bothered by enhancement, and that's the idea that you mentioned, Mark, of gift an ethic of giftedness, uh, which is connected to certain important human virtues. Uh, among them, humility. And overreaching, overreaching with a kind of Promethean aspiration to master and, and dominate everything in nature, including our nature, that seems to me connected, broadly speaking, to a vice, the vice of hubris. And so part of the book is to try to explain why humility matters, why it's worth trying to, uh, well, why it's worth caring about, and how hubris can, in certain circumstances, be a vice, especially where, we're, where it's a case of parents trying to enhance their children or create designer children. Mm -hmm. In the case, so that's one broad ethic, the ethic of giftedness and the virtues and vices that it is connected to, arguably. But we can't decide just invoking that broad ethic how to adjudicate the cases yes. in sport, about golf or whatever it may be. And for that, we have to appeal to a second norm. And those norms have to do with the nature and the purpose of sports, which I think, broadly speaking, uh, one of the purposes of sports is to cultivate, display, and to appreciate uh, natural human talents and gifts. And what counts as doing that for any given sport is debatable, but only up to a point. Take the example of marathon running. Now, 
way back in the day, maybe in ancient Greece, they ran marathons barefoot. And when someone first came up with the idea of a running shoe, it was probably seen as a kind of corruption of the game, right. an unfair enhancement. Well, what about that? I think the test of whether it was or not depends on what the point, what the purpose, or to draw in an Aristotelian idea, the telos mm -hmm. of marathon running is. Well, it's to test the best runner. Mm -hmm. So does the shoe uh, meet or undermine that purpose? It depends whether, I, I think it's arguable that the shoe helps, it promotes the test of the truly most excellent runner because it removes contingencies that aren't really related to being the best runner, like whether you happen to step on a pebble by accident and be thrown off. That's a contingency. Unless you think that avoiding pebbles is really part of what makes a great marathon run. That would be the test. Now let me give you one on the other side. About 10 years ago in the Boston Marathon, Rosie Ruiz, you remember her? She won the Boston Marathon. She crossed the finish line first. And she was given the prize until it was discovered that she had used an enhancement. Mm -hmm. She, after leaving the starting line, hopped on the T, took the green lines, <laughs> and went just before the finish line, got out of the green line, ran across the finish line. Now, what is the difference between the enhancement of the running shoe and the enhancement of the green line? Now, you could say, well, the problem is she was the only one using it. All right, but suppose you just change the rules. As you said with golf, the rules are arbitrary. They can be changed. We could change the rules of the Boston Marathon to say, well, everyone can use the green line. <laughs> but that would change, <laughs> well, it would change the nature, the purpose, the telos of the marathon, and it would do it in a way that would fail to honor or appreciate the human excellences that the marathon is meant to test if people just rode the green line. Whereas that isn't true, or at least it could be argued that that's not true, where you have running shoes to keep people from accidentally stepping on pebbles because that, after all, isn't the point of the race. So this is, I'm sorry, a long answer to say there are two norms. One is this broad ethical norm of the gift, but to apply it in the case of sports, we have to reason our way to some normative understanding of what the point of sports is. And likewise, in the case of parenting, when we get to that, what is the point, what is the purpose, what is the proper relation of parents to children? All right, so let's just push a little bit long on the sports yeah. issue, and then we'll come back to the other ones. Um, why can't it be a changing perspective on what the telos or the point of the sport is? So I played tennis in right. college at a point which was a transition between wood rackets and yeah. these monstrous titanium right. larger head and right. everybody hated it yeah because it changed the game dramatically you could yeah. now hit shots that you could never have hit before yeah okay it changed the sport completely right. it made the serves faster it made the depth of the shot better you could right. get more things you get this fish net of a head rather yeah. than this tiny thing yeah. it really changed the game yeah but now we don't think about it anymore i mean people who played in the in the wooden area probably do go Boy, those were the days with those good old wood rackets, right? right. Yeah, we're kind of done with that. Right. right. So in some sense, the expectations of what will count as a good shot sure. have just shifted. So the bar, so what, in other words, they're putting it, the bar has changed. Right. The expectation of what counts as a great tennis player right. is different than it was when Rod Laver and Ken Rawls were right. playing, right? right, 20, 30 years ago. Right. Do you think it was, by the way, was it a better game then or now, do you think? No, it was a different game. Well, I know it was different, game. but what do you but just for your opinion, off the record, was it a bad, do you think no, it was a better game? No, no, A better game now? No, I think it's an equally good game, because the issues are still the same. Can you return the serve? Can you hit a volley? Can you hit a deep yeah. shot down the line? And those the re are the reason things. I'm asking is, yeah. we can make sense of those discussions and yeah. debates and arguments that sports fans have, whether the game was better then when they yes. used a wooden racket, right. or now, and just as people can make sense of the arguments, is, uh, is it better in the American League with a designated hitter than in the National League or than it was before without a designated hitter? We can make sense. All that's required for my position is these are not merely arbitrary changes, arbitrary in the sense that there's no rational discussion of a normative kind that we can have. 
we can make mm -hmm. sense and we engage, we find ourselves engaging normative discussions all the time yeah. about whether the designated hitter rule has made for a better game or a worse game or whether graphite tennis rackets make for a better game or a worse game. And what we appeal to is not just the entertainment value, but underlying it, I think, or at least one important test is, does this way of doing it, say with graphite rather than wood, provide a better test of the, of the skills that the game at its best is meant to be about? And so we could debate, should there be cork bats available to everyone, not as cheating mm -hmm. in baseball, or not? Should there be steroids? Should people be free if they were safe to use steroids mm -hmm. in sports? The answer to that, once you remove the cheating issue, the mm -hmm. fairness mm -hmm. issue, if everyone can use it, the answer to that will depend on whether it makes, it makes for a better game which appeals to an underlying telos or norm about whether the game whether the skills that the game is meant to honor, cultivate, test, and appreciate will be better uh, called forth using the cork bat or the graphite tennis racket or not. Okay. That's the test. Okay. So there is an implicit yep. norm whenever That's we right. have these discussions. Okay. So let's take that and make it to, let's t raise it to a broader question, yeah. which is why why should we care? Let's take the sports case, but let's move it to a different zone. Right. Why should we care that it is better? Why shouldn't we have the view that, look, let's let all possibilities go? You know, as you put in your book, if we grow 650-pound linemen who are better at defending the line, but it's just different, why should we care? Why shouldn't, for example, we have two leagues? The 650-pound linemen and the 300-pound linemen. Well, we do, have two, we do have two leagues as far as the designated hitter is concerned, and we know which one is better. <laughs> but unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not sure that's the better game. It's the <laughs> they've developed better players, but I'm not sure it's a better game. You Cause could cause have... Because you're, you're, you're raising in part, I want to move it over, is yeah. there is an implicit ethical issue there is, here. There is. Because on the one hand, you want to take, I think, the strong point is that you could have two different leagues, and right. those who want to watch the enhanced players, watch the enhanced players. And yeah. those who like the purity of it, watch the pure ones, right? right? And you just have two leagues. I mean, it's in the same way that the Olympics, which were, you, were, were, were in the past, not professionals. There were right. people who had their day jobs, and they happened to run a marathon occasionally. Right. That's not it anymore. They're not right. professionals. They are. That's changed. And for some of us, we don't like that part of the Olympics, right? right. Okay, but why not have two Olympics, the guys who want to focus their lives on doing Olympics and the ones who want to have a day job and then occasionally play a game right. of tennis or whatever it is. Two leagues. Right. The, you could have two and you could have one league with, um, someone has described it as uh, a, a kind of the, the enhanced, where, where all enhancements go, let's say in, in running. And then you could have another one where you would have, this, this is one writer in Wired magazine said, and you could have another league with free-range slowpokes <coughs> running, unadulterated by drugs or genetic enhancement. And the, uh, and the writer said, uh, and I'm sure I know which would get the better television ratings, but here's, here's what's objectionable about that. The genetically enhanced, pumped up um, form essentially, uh, well, if I'm right about these underlying norms, it corrupts or degrades athletic competition as an arena that prizes and honors and appreciates the display of natural talents and gifts. It turns sport into spectacle. And what would happen if you had steroid-enhanced sluggers openly, not cheating, openly free to have home run hitting contests, is you would essentially turn baseball into one big home run hitting contest. And some people might find that amusing for a while. It might be a source of entertainment, 
in the same way that the home run derby before the All-Star game is. A, it's a kind of entertainment, but it's sort of like a carnival sideshow. No one who really appreciates baseball and its subtlety and nuance and the range of excellences and that it displays and the complexities of strategy, no one would say that a home run hitting contest, even one where you could watch uh, enhanced sluggers hit 600 foot home runs, is a better sport. It would be a spectacle. Mm -hmm. And spectacles can be amusing, but they are stripped down, corrupted, impoverished. See, this is all an ethical vocabulary. But they are stripped down, impoverished, corrupted versions of, of sport. Mm -hmm. That something is lost. So you could have both. Yeah. You could have both. Though it also, if, if spectacle begins to predominate over sport, there is a further risk, which is that spectacle can contaminate the real thing because people become habituated mm -hmm. to seeing a kind of instant graphic, vulgar display, whether it's lifting a car on some of these t you know, TV shows where they have people lift cars. It's not like Olympic weightlifting mm -hmm. or like a home run derby with enhanced. And so they their sensibilities and capacities for appreciating the richer range of virtues could be dulled by the, if, if spectacle began to crowd out sport. Mm -hmm. So there is a contagion that I also worry, worry about. Okay, so, so now this raises, I think... Uh, you don't seem moved by that, Mark. I, I, I mean, or well, do you I'm, think I'm, there is I, something I, to no, that? No, I mean, I, I am moved by it, but I All guess right. there seems to me there's, a, there's another underlying you're assumption. Not, are, you, are, you, are you a sports fan of some... I'm a sports fan. Of some passion. And what is the sport that you well, most... Mostly tennis and running. Tennis and running. Less complex, I'm not moved by less, less complex I'm not sports moved by baseball, than some, yeah. so it's yeah. a less yeah. dramatic <laughs> effect. But right. okay. But here, here's something that seems to me yeah. that, 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 that's worrying in the conversation, and it's, it's, it's a, a theme that runs out throughout the book, but it's right. also very relevant, I think, to MBB ish type of issues. Yeah. One side of the question is seems to me an assumption that you enhance, but you've now forgotten. Let, let's, let's say we find, as recently uh, published, this. Uh, genetic manipulation of uh, this effect in mice that creates these super mice right. that can run six hours longer than the normal mice who have greater sexual stamina and live longer. All right, now, you know, there are probably a lot of people signing up for that manipulation, right? Um, all right, now, we've got this manipulation. For all, for all three of those. For all three mm -hmm. of those, right, yeah. right. So we have, we have this manipulation. But now, what's forgotten, of course, is how the manipulation is going to interact with the sure. environment. So part one is, you're leaning heavily in Against Perfection on biological manipulations. But if everybody gets the biological manipulation, there's how that biology interacts with the environment that's going to continue to give us the variation that we see without the manipulation in some sense. It will change perhaps where we are, but you still have that biology interacting with that environment. The second is the flip side of that. Forget the biological manipulation. What about the extreme environmental manipulation? That, of course, many parents are completely vulnerable to. Right. Making their kids crazy by practicing the piano six hours a day right. or playing tennis every day. So how do you navigate one form of manipulation right. with how it interacts with the environment right. and how do you think about the biological manipulation as opposed to or in addition right. to the well, environment? There, there are two issues there. Let me take the second first about the environmental versus the biological manipulation. There are some critics of genetic engineering for enhancement who say there is a clear principal distinction between parents forcing their kids to practice the piano and go to swimming lessons and all, do all of this, parents dominating and managing their children's academic careers on the one hand, and parents who would go in for Ritalin for their kids to do better on tests, or parents who would go in for genetic manipulation of their kids, or height enhancement to make their kids taller, that sort of thing. And they argue that tweaking genes, messing with biology, that runs deeper, it's more dangerous, and uh, not only in terms of health effects, but it's, it's a deeper kind of intrusion than environmental kinds of effects and high-pressure parenting. I myself don't draw a bright line between them. I think there is 
more continuity if we're talking now about the hyperparenting. There is a continuity between the high-tech hyperparenting, height enhancement, Ritalin, and all of that stuff, and the low-tech, simply high-pressure uh, kind of parenting. There, there is more of a continuity there than some critics of enhancement acknowledge. But what I would conclude uh, from the fact that there is a certainly a similarity of spirit and disposition uh, between the two, I would not conclude that therefore genetic engineering for enhancing children or creating web signing chil designer children is okay because it's like what we do now. I would draw the opposite conclusion. I would say maybe our debates about new biology and the new genetics and the ethical issues that they raise should lead us to rethink, and maybe with a critical eye, the low-tech hyperparenting that's rife and I think destructive mm -hmm. today. Destructive of the, uh, not only from the standpoint of the, the children who go through a kind of uh, highly pressurized high school experience before they get to college, and even before with their parents trying to get them into the best preschool, nursery school, and so on, I think it's damaging to students. I think it's damaging to the relation between parents and children. And I also think it reaches the, the questions of hubris and humility that we were talking about mm -hmm. before in the mm -hmm. case of sports enhancement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The idea that parents, I think it's important that parents realize that even when they're doing what they think is best for their children, in the hyperparenting, that beyond a certain point, parents need to learn a certain humility uh, and a certain that there are certain limits to the project of mastery and dominion and control and choice. And children are having children uh, and seeing them being recalcitrant to the controlling impulses of parents. That's a an important lesson for the parents. But why do you think, y it seems that you think that humility and hubris would disappear as a function of the biological manipulation. Why wouldn't it just change the competitive playing field? So tomorrow I get to choose the eye color of my child and right. its height um, and some level of IQ. But there are all sorts of other things that I won't be able to control for. Or, or I raise that bar, and because of the interactions of the environment, you know, it's just the way of the playing field just changes yet again. And right. I'm still stuck with this kid who's you know, not as good as the guy next door. Right. You mean because there's an arms race and they're doing the same race, thing? Which, which we've seen over the course of evolution, right? right? The arms race just keep getting, you know, the Joneses just keep getting better and better and better. And right. So it's just going to change. Well, they're, they're the arms race argument, and in the case of height enhancement, this you can see this very clearly. Parents who want height enhancement go in for uh, uh, growth hormone for children who may be shorter than they want to be. Maybe they want to play basketball, but who have no hormonal deficiency. And the FDA has wrestled with whether to permit the use of, the use of prescription, whether to authorize uh, human growth hormone for healthy kids whose parents simply want them to be taller, maybe to make the basketball team. Now, there's a case where you could see, now one obstacle to there being an endless arms race, hormonal arms race, is cost. It's hugely expensive. But if we thought it were important enough, we could deal with that problem by having publicly subsidized height enhancements. Mm -hmm. But then you would, simply being, uh, you would simply raise the bar, and being six foot three would no longer be enough to make even the high school basketball team. You'd have to be six feet six. And then eventually, maybe they'd have to raise the basket, and we'd start all over again. So there, one argument against uh, in, uh, going in for genetic engineering for enhancement, for non-medical enhancement, is precisely this. If it's self-defeating, as you suggest, yeah. if it's self-defeating, that's a good reason not to expend huge resources mm -hmm. uh, doing it. Mm -hmm. And the, the height case is clearly self-defeating, writ large, and, and maybe more broadly. But I think that's an argument not to do it rather than a defense mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. if it's self-defeating in that way. Okay, so I want to I make sure we have a little time for some questions. Yeah. Let me just, one kind of last 
for discussion point. How, how would this then move you towards issues, for example, like plastic surgery for right. beautifying reasons? Right. Right. And here I want to bring up just an issue that came up in a panel that you and I, you organized a while ago, which are these very bizarre cases of amputee wannabes. Right. So for those of you unfamiliar with this genre of people, um, these are people who, um, I take it in part due to finding themselves on the internet, have discovered that there are certain people who actually would like to amputate a significant part of their body. This sounds like it's very bizarre, but I guess the diagnosis that we, we heard about is that they don't seem to be psychologically deranged or abnormal in some clinical way, right. but rather that for a variety of reasons they discovered that they would better identify with a father, a mother, or a, some relative friend who happened to be missing a limb, and that the only way for them to feel psychologically okay is to amputate this limb. So in the one case, you have various kinds of plastic surgery which often build up something or take something away. Those are also various enhancements. In right. some of these cases, there are clearly psychological issues at stake because the person will feel better, so they right. say, right. if they look like this. Right. How does that get weighed into right. the arguments about enhancement? Well, let's first put aside those uses of plastic surgery that are not merely, uh, not strictly cosmetic, but are repairing yeah. some injury or for a burn victim. Put those aside yeah. because those are clear. clearly me medical, yeah. restoring. Uh, but of purely elective, purely preferential cosmetic surgery, even before we get to the amputees by choice, um, I think it's something that's not particularly admirable, which isn't to say that, I, uh, that it should be banned. I think it's a relatively minor vice. It's the vice of vanity, I suppose. It's a minor vice among the social problems we have. It doesn't loom large. Um, I do have, rather than ban it, I do have a public policy to deal with it that reflects my uh, lack of admiration, my sense that it's a small sin. Don't ban it. Permit cosmetic surgery, but do two things. For physicians who are primarily in the business of cosmetic surgery for enhancement, they should have to repay with interest all of the federally subsidized loans for their medical school education, <laughs> because that's not something that is for the public good. The assumption, and this gets back to our distinction at the beginning between medical purposes and non-medical consumer choice, which is essentially what we're talking about. Uh, so if it's not for the, the common good. Sh they should have to pay back uh, to the hospitals and to the federal government and to the universities all of the subsidies they enjoy to get the training that they're now using essentially to perform a consumer service, not a medical purpose. The second thing I would do would be, since huge resources are expended. If you compare the expenditure on purely cosmetic surgery in the developed world with the expenditures it would take to meet pressing uh, basic health needs in this country and around the world, it's, it's, it's appalling. And it goes beyond a small question of vanity. So I would have a sin tax. We have sin taxes for alcohol, for smoking, and so on. I would tax cosmetic surgery and the, peop the tax would go to uh, support the uh, national health care system. That's what I would do with cosmetic surgery. But there's a broader point, which is, and it goes to the general question of enhancement as an expression of freedom, mm -hmm. which is one of the big arguments, that the more we can control our biological destiny, the freer we are. So why not use biomedical technology to expand human choice and freedom? Mm -hmm. That's the biggest argument in favor. Uh, biggest argument against my position. Mm -hmm. But I would say to that, is it really an enlargement of our freedom? Look at the, what are the looks, what are the faces, what are the features that people who go to cosmetic surgeons want? This is not an expression of genuine individuality and nonconformity. It's the opposite. The facial features that people are clamoring for when they go to cosmetic surgeons, by and large, are highly conformist with a, a certain kind of look that's promulgated in the, 
in the uh, celebrity culture, on, on uh, billboards, advertising, commercial advertising. That's what they're going in for, by and large. And there's an important moral in that story, not that that's such a grave issue in and of itself. That, there, that we have a choice with, that modern biotechnology gives us. Modern biotechnology says we can change, we can fix our nature to fit the world and the social roles we've created. And I think that's actually the opposite of human freedom because it distracts us from the larger part of freedom, which is taking those social roles and the rewards that they bring if you're tall. You know, if you're tall, you have a 10% average lifetime premium in, in earnings over people who are short, economists have found. So we could try to change people through biotechnology to fit the world, to make them taller or to change their facial features to look more like billboards, ads for cosmetics. Or we can change the world to fit the kind of creatures that we are. I think human freedom is more about changing the world to fit our nature than trying to use biotechnology to re-engineer ourselves to fit the social grooves and roles and reward systems that are not given by nature, but just happen to be there. That's my biggest terrific. worry about enhancement. Yeah, yeah terrific. Um, let's have a few questions. Yeah. Well, then let's, let's go after, let's combat that prejudice. Let me give you a, a clearer case. Sex selection is now possible. It's not a science fiction scenario. It's possible to choose whether to have a boy or a girl through pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, embryo screening, which was developed to test for genetic abnormalities but can be used for purely preferential non-medical sex selection. Uh, and there are for-profit fertility clinics that offer it. You can go to a clinic in Los Angeles, pay $19,000, have no fertility issue at all, but simply to choose the sex of your child. And that you, it can also now be done through sperm sorting with a slightly lesser degree of certainty, but pretty high. There's a company in, in Virginia that, will, that has a way of spinning sperm. And the X-bearing and Y-bearing sperm have different weights, so you can choose the uh, 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 preconception sex selection. That machine, by the way, was developed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture for cattle breeding. And a bright entrepreneur said, here's a market for human beings, and so you can do it. In India and uh, many parts of Asia, China, Korea, sex selection is already going on using low-tech means, not even PGD mainly using ultrasound and sex-selective abortion, and in some cases, infanticide. And so the sex ratios are thrown off considerably. We know that in China, in Korea, parts of northern India, 140 boys for every 100 girls. Now, would you make your argument then? The argument there is, look, boys are preferred. There is a prejudice against girls in our culture. Having boys is more useful given the way we've set up our society. Girls are expensive and they're socially less uh, desired. So we have a choice. We can use technology to accommodate that cultural prejudice and let people choose boys. Or we can but the risk, one of the risks of doing that is, first of all, it per perpetuates an injustice. Beyond that, it caves into the prejudice. It leaves unexamined and unchallenged those cultural prejudices. And that's what I mean by the difference between using technology to cave into social roles and prejudices 
leaving them intact rather than exercising our judgment and our freedom to change those practices. That's what I really want. No, what do you, what do you Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's good. All right. It is. It is a possible counter argument. Here's what I would say to it. Conceiving sport as mainly about will and drive and effort, I think, is itself a misunderstanding of what athletic competition is about. We do tend these days, I think, to overemphasize the element of effort, will, and drive in sport and to downplay the element of excellence. And you see this when the, uh, in the Olympic coverage, when instead, because they have to appeal to a big audience, an audience of people who don't really appreciate, I don't claim to appreciate the, the subtleties of downhill skiing or of the triathlon or these races where you have to shoot and then cross-country ski and then run and do various other things. So who understands all of that at once every four years? Very few people. And so coverage is lavished on the stories, the heart-rending stories. You must have seen this in the Olympics, of how the person overcame a bad childhood or a crippling injury and managed to overcome or there was a civil war and they, in their country and they managed to escape and even it to become through their great efforts and exertions waking up every morning at 3 a.m. to become a great figure skater and so on. So the, the sob stories, the back story is the sob story which is really about, it's not just that it's tear jerking, it's doing so in a way that plays up the idea that effort, drive, and will are the essence of athletic competition or sport. But that's a corruption, that's a degradation, but it's one that we easily slide into, not only because people don't know all about the sports enough to appreciate the actual skill of the skier, but also because the idea that, see, the idea that it's really about effort and trying that's a congenial to the democratic spirit. We could all do it, maybe, if we tried hard enough. Whereas the idea that it's also or largely about excellence and that that's what we're appreciating, that idea doesn't fit as easily with the democratic spirit. Excellence is, it's an aristocratic ethic and we're a little uncomfortable with it, and which is why we tend to turn sports, to, to, to turn the norm, the purpose of telos of sport into effort and will. But effort and will, those are, I think, pale and limited and partial virtues. They are virtues. They're worthy of admiration up to a point. But they aren't everything. Not in sports, certainly not in art, not in music, not in science. I mean, you wouldn't think that you wouldn't admire, uh, if you were looking at scientists you admire, you wouldn't really want to know well, who really tried hardest to, to get to be a great scientist. It would be a, a, a way of thinking about this. Imagine you heard two violin players, two 
virtuous, two, sorry, two great violin performances. And later you learn one of them had to practice 14 hours a day for a year to achieve that. And the other one, who played just as beautifully, took, took the piece of music the week before and was able to do that. Whom would you admire more? That's one test of the ethic of excellence versus the excellence, uh, ethic of mm -hmm. trying effort. Well, the, I think the excellence isn't the genetics either. It's not will and it's not genetics. It's partly to do with the negotiation of the athlete with his or her natural gift, the cultivation, the negotiation, which is neither genetics nor will. It's something in between. Let's take one more question. Because of nutritional improvements, do you mean? And as far as height. The question is, what's the background technology that sets the norm of human height, for example, because height has varied historically? Well, I'm not, too, I, I'm not too worried about that. That's a question of the gray area. What matters to me is normal human functioning. And so there could be a wide range of, of heights or normal heights at different periods in human history that would set that norm. So I don't think that that quasi-anthropological question is so decisive for, for the, the moral question because I don't have a lot at stake in saying, well, it must be the, the existing one. Um, but I mean, that's, that's kind of a line drawing question, I think, rather than a, a question of principle. Maybe there are a couple more. Can we take a couple more? <coughs> all right, well, longevity is a, all right, longevity is a harder case. Yes. Right, longevity is harder, and I'm not, I'm not sure or not confident that the arguments that I've made against enhancement would condemn attempts to certainly not to increase the average human lifespan. They wouldn't condemn those uh, efforts. A harder question is whether they would call into question efforts to extend the maximum human lifespan. And there are some people who would worry, who do worry a lot about that. I don't worry so much even about that, short of immortality, because I think that would fundamentally transform um, what it is to be a human being and what it is to aspire and what it is to have life plans and what it is to think about oneself in relation to subsequent generations and how many generations of great grandchildren and so on. But uh, longevity as such, certainly the average lifespan, I, I would not see that as a, a troubling, particularly troubling uh, project. But I do think we should not be aiming, we shouldn't focus as a priority on uh, increasing the lifespan. What we should be aiming at is alleviating senescence. The, the, the problem is not that some people die sooner rather than later. The problem the larger medical problem and human problem is the senescence that is accompanying the, um, the greater average lifespan that we've been able to achieve through other medical breakthroughs. So that's what we should work on. And then I'm told by people who work on this that, well, addressing senescence medically is going to actually push out. So what would be the ideal? Would the ideal be to live with the vigor and the memory 
and the athletic prowess of a 25-year-old until age, what's the a average in the United States now? Until age 75, add a few, till age 79, and then drop dead like that in full flower of health? <laughs> Um, 85, 90, whatever it is. Or is there something important in the, the fact that at least so far we do tend to age before we die? I think that's an open question. I don't have the answer to it. But my temptation is to, to go after senescence, not lifespan, insofar as they're separate. Goals. But why go after senescence? I mean, that is also manipulating the natural, you know, right. part of human nature. Why is that any different than changing the spores, right? I mean, right. part of having being human nature is senescing. Yeah. Is well, I don't. I'm. I'm. My argument is not based on valorizing or sanctifying nature. It isn't. There's so lots gift, of gift, nature. Gift, is, gift isn't a, 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 a. Well, gift combined with these other norms. So I'm all for assaulting the given, assaulting nature, where we're talking about smallpox and malaria. Um, and so I'm, I wouldn't say that, or, or surg surgery is an assault on the natural. Um, and I'm, I'm for that. So simply appealing to nature and valorizing or sanctifying it is the way some people do argue against genetic bioengineering. It's not my way because I think you have to point to norms, identify norms, which I was trying to do only partially convincingly to Mark in the case of sports. The, the norm of giftedness together with the norms, what makes those practices, parenting or athletic competition, mm -hmm. valuable, valuable human goods. I think you have to appeal to those, not just directly to nature, because there's lots of nature that's bad and that biomedical science should go after, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Great question.